Hi, welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'm Karen Stevens, your host for today. And joining me is our inquisitive panel, Ms. Iris Acker, actress and producer of Spotlight on the Arts, Mr. Michael McKeever, actor and famed playwright, and Mr. Bill Hirschman, chief theater critic for Florida Theater on Stage.com and a wonderful journalist. And today we're discussing the importance of sound design in the theater. And our guest today is Mr. Matt Corey. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Very Karen. glad to have you it's here. Great to be here. So, just give us a little background. Tell us um, how you got into sound design, what sound design is, um, to help us jump into this topic. Um, it, sound design, um, for me, kind of fell into my lap. I got really lucky um, that uh, I had done one play for the Women's Theater Project, um, which was literally pulling some effects off of a, a CD. And um, right after that, Mike Hoffman, who used to do the original music and sound at Gable Stage, had to um, relocate to um, New Mexico or something. And uh, he recommended, he, he knew that I was involved in um, composition and production um, because he was friends with my, my pop. Um, so he recommended me to Joe Adler, who called me up out of the blue. Um, and I didn't respond to his phone call for about three days because I, I was, I only knew of Joe by reputation and I was kind of nervous. I'm like, I don't know if this is going to be the best anybody. way for me to get into this. Um, I, I was intimidated. I, I did call him back eventually and um, he had me down to see Misery and I thought we were going to have an actual meeting and I saw him and he popped me with the script for Brooklyn Boy and said, read this, tell me what you think. And um, the rest has been history. I've Isn't done every wow. show but one since Brooklyn Boy back in, I think, 2006. So you had no prior experience with creating sound, or you just did it on your not, own? Not for theater. Not I, for I did theater. Do, do some composition uh -huh. on my own. Uh -huh. and, um, I had done a lot of voiceover recording and production and voiceover demos for people, but never anything for for theater. So you're just a genius because you're one of the busiest sound designers in South Florida. Uh, <laughs> that's very kind of you to say that. Yes. Oh, that's not, not his day job. <laughs> that's, that's afterward. Uh, Matt, uh, uh, let's talk about the computer. That's what you do everything on, is that so? Yeah. And uh, But the well, thing is, I, I want to know, what they do before computers? You know, I, I had talk this, about the old days. The old days were you, uh, I guess the old, old days were uh, either real to real tape decks or cassette decks and multiples so that you could run layers. What's a cassette uh, deck? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, Real young fella. <laughs> the, then, you know, after that, and I think there are some theaters that still do sound this way is with a bank of CD decks. Oh, and wow. even that is difficult because it requires someone to do the kinds of things that you can do on a computer. It's a lot of manual mm. uh, fader moves and uh, and then editing, you can't do on the fly. You have to take it back home or to the studio and recut cues. Do you know how they created Thunder? Oh, with what a the big thing? metal <laughs> thing backstage that they shook the opera. I think they still do it. That's that's what they did. The funny thing is, it doesn't sound anything like Thunder. No, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Tan Rabbit. They do it in the opera. Like, why are they shaking that sheet? <laughs> do they still do it that way? They, yeah, they they try to do that. So because talk about they don't know about Matt Corey, yes. So talk about what you do now, how technology has changed. What are you able to do now that you, they weren't able to do 10, 15, 20 years ago? Yeah. I think um, where it, it's more of a convenience now rather than things that you can and can't do. Uh, like I said, if you had a cue that, that was too long or too short is actually the worst problem uh, when you're on a CD you'd have to get that somewhere to edit and then reburn the CD and you'd end up having piles of, of mm -hmm. CDs that were useless. And now if you need to trim uh, 10 seconds off uh, a cue or if you need to, to loop a cue um, you know, for an ambient sound, it's real easy to do that on the computer. And I think those kinds of things are the, the, the you save time with the computer um, provided that it is operating like you well, want well, it to be. How does, it, how does it work? Uh, uh, an artistic director or director um, commissions you to do the sound design for a show. He hands you the script. What happens then? Um, well, I go through kind of like an actor would go through and highlight their lines. I do the, that with all the, the practical sound effects that are scripted. 
um, that gives you a kind of a good idea if you're going to be busy or if you're going to be, uh, you know, how from sound there. intensive the the, yeah. Um, yeah. the show is. Do, do you say you have? Uh, let's talk about thunder. There's a storm that's happening outside the the front door. Do you give the the director a choice of storms, a heavy storm, a mild uh-huh. storm? I mean, did you give them choices, or do you say this is it? This oh no, you don't say this is it. <laughs> <laughs> you let them to always feel like they have choices. There you go. Oh, like uh, they have you kind of push the one that you that you feel. Sure, you kind of lead with that one, and and. There you go. Um, you know, every director is going to be open. They, they want it to be as good as it can be, too. So um, I, I think the key is to be flexible, flexible during tech so that you have options. If, and sometimes, too, you know, you, when I listen to a sound at home in my studio there, Sounds great, and then I bring it into the space, and then it sounds like wow. like complete. You have some sound you brought us today. What'd you bring? Oh, this is just a, a fun one I brought uh, for you guys. Oop. Um, the, if you go to Gable Stage right now and see uh, Sons of the Prophet, you'll hear the, the, this exact cue, and you've um, yeah. written about this. But um, it's a, a phone conversation with an automated um, response thing. You, you'll you'll get it when you hear. All right, it. let me hear. Welcome to Dr. Manners Automated Voice System. To continue in English, please press one. Actor presses one. If you're calling from a pharmacy, say pharmacy. Actor if says you're a patient pharmacy. Looking, I think you said Karen Stevens. Is that right? <laughs> then they say I no. think you said Big Mike McKeever. <laughs> Is that right? Uh, no. Sorry, you are having trouble. If you're calling from a pharmacy. Say, pharmacy. I think you said... Iris Acker. Is that right? No. One moment, I'll transfer you. <laughs> and then this, the actor's on hold. Your call is important to us. Please leave a detailed message and... Bill Hirschman. We'll return your call within 24 hours. Anyway, that was, uh, that's the exact uh, that's thing. But I want, to point <laughs> that's I want to point something out that amazed me. Both this cue and there's another set of cues later, that, that another conversation that he has. If you'll notice, there is a point where when the operator comes back in after he says something, she jumps right back in in the sense that it's in a real tape. They aren't really waiting to listen to your answer. It's a mechanical thing. And you can hear, like you would in real life, the splice between the fact that whoever recorded this says something, and then all of a sudden says something else. It's very, very subtle. And yet, it gives a verisimilitude that is everybody who's ever been on one of these phone calls. But my point being is that it's very subtle stuff. And in fact, one of the things we've talked about before is whether you actually want people in the audience in general to notice your work. You've just mm-hmm. done a show up in Palm Beach County where it was uh, you were creating a sounds of nature uh, and there are birds and there's all kinds of sounds. And yet, while it creates a very clear environment, I don't know if the audience turns to their partner and go, wow, that was really realistic. What do you want? When, uh, from your work. Do you want people to go, wow, that was great Sam. The ambient stuff is tough. No, you, you really probably don't want people to be focusing on that. Um, you want to help set, you know, you kind of take the lead of the lights and the set and try to, to fill in the rest of that in the outside world. Um, but the, the la- I'm always fearful that it's going to be annoying. Crickets. If they're just a little bit too loud, someone's gonna be like, "God, that's the worst sounding," you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll take you right out. And if, as you're watching um, tech runs and preview, I think those jump out at me because uh, I'm kind of hypersensitive about annoying the audience. Um, if you hear a loop point in a queue uh, where a bird, you, where you can predict when the bird will mm. chirp again, mm-hmm. uh, then you have to kill that queue. It's mm-hmm. not you'll you'll get beat up about it. So. Well, um, you don't really want it to be noticed, but I, I really the, like when people do catch the subtle things that, that you mentioned. That's fun. The play the birds. Mosaic. Just want to carve it out. I'm, that I'm wasn't talking very about subtle. The sounds. <laughs> <laughs> the sounds for that were annoying. Oh, it really? It was supposed to be. Oh, <laughs> scary. I thought it was terrifying. Scary. Yeah. Where did 
did you get? What did you get? What did you come up with the sounds for the birds? And, uh, that was yeah. trickier than I th I thought it was going to be. Um, I thought there would be like a library of bird sounds, especially the the flapping wings, mm -hmm. which can, we used can a we lot describe of. Describe what the show was yeah, about. Ahead. Oh, um, well, it's kind of a, a psychological thriller in a house, and you never see any birds. It was that was all created with sound and some lighting effects outside the the house, which. Um, uh, it was a lot of fun to, to do that, but we put eight speakers around the house, which was, I think, a record for Mosaic. Wow! Uh, and that was kind of fun. And they were they weren't like um, matched speakers or anything. It was like stuff we were pulling out of closets oh. just to make a sound somewhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, you know, at at times you would hear the the birds descend on the house. And that was kind of the challenge, is to make you make the audience feel like they were in that house. It was terrifying with yeah. the with the birds. Well, I'm glad you liked it. That was yeah. cool. Yeah. So obviously, uh, sound is very integral to the theatrical experience. Like just as in movies, there's always music that will augment a scene or or help uh, you set the emotional tone. Of a, of a scene, so likewise with theater, right? I mean, was there ever a time when sound wasn't as integral? I mean, is there such a thing as theater with, I mean, we've become so used to having that accompaniment when we go to see a production. Um, has there ever been a time when it wasn't as pervasive and, and, and you know? Well, I think it's it's just changed a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, there used to be more live musicians employed yes. yeah. um, for for incidental music, and now that's I would say ninety five percent of the time we have to pre record mm -hmm. that stuff, um, and you know I think our modern audiences expect to be kind of dazzled with lights and sound for a lot of a lot of the newer plays. Um, I hope that playwrights get out of the uh, habit of scripting in so many cell phone rings. <laughs> That's, that always poses a problem. And talk about annoying. No, note to self. Especially when they, when they come out of the wrong place. I mean, it's, it's hard to, yeah. you, sometimes you have to burn three outputs of speakers just for to make the cell phone ring in the right place. Well, it used to be easy because it used to be a phone on a table, but that's long gone Rigged now. Rigged up to the button. Yeah. 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 I always like to see those. <laughs> those 1990s period mm -hmm. pieces. With a nice tinny ring with a speaker right under the table. It's easy. Yeah. Sometimes you make the actual phone ring oh, with the better. telecube. I always like that too. But yeah, the, the cell phones are, are tricky. Uh, but you know, I think um, it's, uh, it's something that we're going to be seeing. I think as we get, um, especially into the musicals and things like that, that it's an amazing amount of uh, technology that's involved in producing the sound for those, and it's only going to get more and more to keep people interested. Speaking about music, <laughs> as a um, as a sound designer, and I know you're a musician as well, do you ever compose original scores for any of the shows you do? I, I do. Um, if if that's a, a route that the director wants to take, I'm, um, I, I will usually offer that. Uh, but it's kind of a separate discussion from the sound design, as you know. I see. Um, I don't think that. If you accept a sound design gig, that you wouldn't necessarily be expected to compose. Of course, that yeah. Um, I like to do it um, because my background's in music, and and it's a good um, creative outlet, of course. And I like I'm not one to really write music for pleasure so much, or just to mm -hmm. express. But I do like to have that um, construct of the script as a springboard for mood and things like that. That helps me to write. Let's talk about the sound in the house. Um, I went to the theater house? yesterday. When I was <laughs> Pristine. Uh, I went to the theater yesterday. It was too loud. Mm. The same theater um, is very sporadic, according to where you sit. Mm -hmm. And um, do you control that as well when you work in the theater? Uh, I wish we could. Um, and you know, the, you as a sound designer, I think you would always want to make every aspect of what's going into the audience's ears, you know, as good as it can be. Um, but there are, there are limitations. And a lot of times, too, you know, you mentioned volume. That's a subjective thing. There's a lot of um, producers and directors that want loud. And I, I always personally, I kind of like to control the volume 
and be able to bring it up if you want to go up. But um, there, you know, there's an aesthetic that hmm. wants to be loud sometimes too. So I, I, it's it's tricky, and the acoustics of the building are also in play. And the louder you get, the more kind of reflections you're going to get, hmm. and then the clarity goes away. So, is there anything you can do about that? I mean, when when you go to a house. There's one we're all thinking of, which until recently had some really significant problems, but the quality has improved over the last couple of seasons. Uh, is there something that can be done besides bringing in an engineer to you know, change where the baffles are and where the sound is reflected? As sound engineer, is there anything, you, or sound designer, is there anything that you can do? As a sound designer, probably not, other than um, really work to control the volume in the space and not to, to have it so loud that you're pounding off the walls. I think um, you know everyone always talks about the sound changing when there's a, a lot of people in the house. That does make a difference. I mean, there's mass involved in, mm -hmm. in having mm -hmm. uh, 500 people or even 150 people in a smaller place. Uh, but really, and, and it's kind of a principle that applies to recording studios as well, you want to have the room be right. And once the room is right, then you can put the equipment in there to take advantage of a good room. Mm -hmm. And anything uh, that you add to a room that isn't acoustically good <laughs> is, you know, it's kind of a, a Band-Aid situation. That just it's sounds not... like a full-time job for you, but I know it isn't. <laughs> Let's talk about your, what you really do. Um, oh, my, my day, day job. job. Your day, day job. job. <laughs> um, Survival job. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, about a year ago, uh, I was appointed uh, CEO of an organization I've been with for 10 years now called Insight for the Blind in Fort Lauderdale. And we have one uh, singular mission, which is to record books and magazines for uh, the blind. And we do this by participating in the Talking Books program with the Library of Congress. And um, we're moving into, this is kind of uh, an exciting thing for us, into um, audio description or, or descriptive video, which um, mm -hmm. you know is an effort to make television shows and movies accessible for the blind as well by kind of filling in the blanks and filling in the gaps in dialogue with um, s stage directions, for lack of a better mm -hmm. uh, term, so that uh, a blind viewer could go through a 10-minute stretch of silence on a show like Mad Men and, and actually understand what's going what's on going? Right. In, the, in the pauses. And um, we work with uh, Steve Gladstone, I'm sure all, you, all of you know him. He's mm -hmm. our blogger. And um, our website is uh, www.insightfortheblind.org. And you can find his blog there and information on, uh, on our, our company. It's um, an amazing place to work. And we're now opening up, um, starting tonight, actually, um, a nighttime session on Monday nights for people in the theater community that want to come in and read an article in a magazine. And that even if they can't commit to a long stretch of time, um, if you can come in once to read and then once to maybe do some corrections, we would love to have anyone that's interested come in and, and volunteer their time. That's great. I was going to ask you what you found. That sounds really exciting. Um, I was going to ask you what you find most exciting about your work as a sound designer. but. That work that you just described <laughs> sounds really it, it's, exciting. It's great. Um, the, the, the staff that I work with, uh, we, we have a full-time staff of four, part-time staff of three. And then each week we see between uh, 60 and 75 volunteers that come in, um, mainly retirees based on our hours. Uh, we, you know, we work uh, 8.30 to 4. Um, but each day has a different personality with the the people that come in on Mondays and people that come in on Fridays. And um, yeah, I don't think of it as a survival job or right. a day job. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's actually yeah. my, my main focus uh, each day is, mm -hmm. is insight. Mm -hmm. So what do you find most exciting about designing uh, sound for the theater? Uh, I, like, um, I like the camaraderie of, of being in a, in a good production team, uh, in a good theater. The scripts, I, I haven't repeated a play um, so it's you're constantly being exposed to, to new scripts and new theater. Uh, of course, I like the composition aspect when I'm able to write for a play. And um, uh, you know, opening night as stressful as that can be, th that's usually a pretty um, a pretty exciting time, and that's when it all pays off when you see it 
all the, the elements together. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's one of the reasons I always liked sports too. I like being part of a team and that camaraderie. Do you ever come up with things for the uh, production that aren't in the script and aren't, and that the director, you, you know, that you make suggestions to the director that he, you know? More often than not, mm -hmm. there, there's stuff that isn't scripted. Mm -hmm. And um, it can be deceptive too if you get a script and you flip through and you see a few cell phone rings and uh, nothing else. You think, oh, this is going to be a walk in the park. But then as you get into the process, you see that, mm -hmm. oh, that maybe this could use some underscoring or some ambient sounds. or um, That's usually guided by the director, though. I try not to voiced too much of my own stuff mm -hmm. on there, at least initially. Mm -hmm. You just try to make yourself available to them for what, whatever they need or might want. Yeah, that, that seems to be the, the best way to work, I think. Once you get into the technical rehearsal and the set is up and the lights are up and you, you're laying down the sounds during the, those runs, how often do you find sound effects work or don't work? And so you have to change them or take them out or, or uh, adjust them. Does that happen often or? Yeah. Um, you're, if, if you go through a tech rehearsal and you don't have to swap out a cue, um, then you're really doing well. Because that, that's, <laughs> I mean, it would be like, you know, a lighting designer setting the lights and then not making Everything an adjustment. Everything being perfect through. right out of the Yeah, game. it really, you can get in the ballpark, but that's the, you know, that you don't really have a preview period like you would like in most places. But um, that, that one and only preview sometimes is really important to see what it's like when there are people in the house and if, if your stuff is really working or if it's uh, still in need of attention. I wonder if one day you can purchase a disc of thunder, lightning. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Saying, yes. It's funny you mention that because um, I think any sound designer will, will have kind of their go-to things like that for like a good thunder. And I, start, I started to feel a little guilty that I was putting the same thunder in <laughs> different places. So I actually spent some money and got new thunder. <laughs> I don't think I've used any of it yet. So but. you don't go out and record like John Travolta. You don't go out and record, uh, what was that, blowout? You're back you in the 19s. You don't, you don't go out and record your own sound in some cases. I, I think if, if that's all that you were doing and, and there was some obscure stuff, that would be really fun to do. Um, <laughs> but the practicality of that is, you know, it, it's, there are people that have done it better than I could probably do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I try to, to use what, what I have. Do, do you have a, an in-house library of sound effects and, and, and well, I guess sound effects that you use or do you go online to find this stuff? How does it, how does it normally work? Yeah, the obscure stuff, um, you can usually find anything online. Um, there was, in Of Mice and Men, there was a horseshoe game um, that we wanted to have as kind of a bed uh, for the two of the scenes that took place uh, in the, the barn. And uh, I, on that sound is actually from a, a championship horseshoe match that was on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> I took that sound because I, I, I don't play horseshoes. I don't know what, what the rhythm is of the game and how much noise there actually is. So it's an actual game um, that was from YouTube. So oh. something like that makes more sense than trying to do, you know, the individual clank of the horseshoe and then repeating that 90 times to make it like a game. Was that the most difficult sound effect that you ever had to come up with? What, what, what do you call this the most difficult? Oh, um, I know there's some that's going to, that would be really hard for me to come up with okay. off the top of my okay. head. That one was not particularly difficult no. because it was an actual game and I just kind of lifted, mm -hmm. lifted that. <laughs> are, are there some that you are just really, really proud of that you go, by God, I did that, <laughs> yeah. and no one is ever going to be able to take that away from me. Um, I think back to talk radio. Yeah, um, at Mosaic. At Mosaic. Yeah. I, th I think that was one that was um, particularly memorable because we had a room full of actors doing live voiceover stuff. Um, you know, six or seven people camped out in there doing that that had to communicate with the actors, you know, Paul, uh, right. who was playing Barry on stage. And we, besides all the phone calls, we still had this bed of sound that went through uh, almost continuously because it was, you know, a radio station. That's kind of what you hear. So that one, that one sticks out of my head still to this day, and that was a while back. And now, from the heart of the Great Lakes, it's time for Cleveland's most popular and controversial talk show, Night Talk with Barry Champlain. And now, ladies and gentlemen, 
Here's Barry. I'm a pretty fit. So do you see yourself doing this for uh, a long time? <laughs> uh, I I would miss it if if I didn't oh, if I didn't do sense. it. Uh, I do to toy with the idea of scaling back some in my head, and uh, as you all know, it's difficult to say no uh, when you're approached to do a project that sounds fun. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably be doing it for a while. Yeah. I don't know how, how busy I will be always, but I would like to keep my hand in it. Yeah. Is there a show that you've seen, either locally or a tour that you went, wow, that just blew my socks off. That's The sound was so great. <laughs> I don't mean just the quality, but the, the, the imagination, the feathering in, having it come from different uh -huh. places in the auditorium, the subtle things like what you did on the tape down there. Um, I didn't get a chance to see the production of War Horse that came mm -hmm. through, but I, I saw the, um, the making of and how a lot of that sound was accomplished, and I, I wish I had been able to see that. Yeah. It, that seemed like one that was really an incredible undertaking. Yeah, it was. I saw it. It was really quite wonderful, yeah. and I had been wanting to see that for a while, and uh, I, was, I was just, you know, I was in awe. Um, but I, I want to congratulate you on your success. We'd all like to congratulate you oh, on yes. your success. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, Absolutely. Like I said, you're one of the busiest sound designers in the area, and uh, you keep getting busier. So I don't know how you managed to juggle that with the other work that you have that you're so passionate about. But all I can say is just keep doing it, you know, because <laughs> um, whatever you're doing is working, and um, and I, you know, you, you just get get better and better and better. Um, but I wanted to say thank you to the panel. You guys are all so great. Uh, <laughs> you, you ask great questions <laughs> of our guests. <laughs> and is there something you'd like to leave us with today, Matt? Oh, man, you got the wrong guy. <laughs> 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 okay, well, I will say, can I say uh -huh. insightforthebind.org? That would be wonderful yes. if everyone yes. would check that yes. out. Yes, absolutely. We'll thank you. That up absolutely. You. Thank you for being with us today. And thank you for being with us here on Spotlight on the Arts. We'd like to encourage all of you to please, please go to the theater, patronize the theater. And if you want to know what's happening, go to floridatheateronstage.com. Thank you. <laughs>